Welcome to the narrated step-by-step -step tutorial for my painting, Spring Green. The photograph on the right was the reference and inspiration for this painting. I was attracted to it with all the, the bright green colors as the, the leaves start to come out in the springtime, but there's still a lot of kind of drab neutral colors around from winter still where uh, a lot of the ground cover hasn't quite recovered. There's a few adjustments I made to the composition. There's a long branch in the photograph that's coming out from the big uh, tree in the foreground. I really didn't like that branch in the composition so I left it out. And I also altered the placement of a few of the rocks to, to uh, what I felt better fit the frame of reference for my composition. And there's some areas where I simplified. This is the pencil sketch. I'm working on a quarter sheet, 11 inches by 15 inches, of 140 pound cold press Lanacora watercolor paper, and I've drawn this with a B pencil. And really what I've done is drawn the major shapes and suggested where some of the placement of the rocks and the trees are. You can find the sketch from my online learning center landing page. If you go to the landing page from my online learning center and go to the top, you'll see a tab labeled YouTube reference. Just click on that tab and it will take you to the reference material for this tutorial. As I mentioned, I was attracted to the bright green colors amongst all the neutrals in this subject. And uh, when you think about this and try and decide what the best way to approach this is, you have to give a lot of attention to the textures. There's so many leaves and so many branches and so many little rocks that it's hard to look at these as individual items. When you start thinking about them, with regards to texture and patterns, you can start to formulate a, an approach to, uh, to represent what you're seeing here in the photograph and give the suggestion of all the foliage and all the, the branches and the rocks that are laying around by using texture. With that in mind, you have to start thinking about how to approach this. I'm not going to render every leaf on the tree and every rock on the ground. I'm going to uh, suggest them with textures and patterns. I want to capture the, the sparkling green tones against the darker, uh, sometimes cooler tones that are behind it, the, all the bright tones. And when I think about this, one of the ways that I like to approach it to create textures like this is using masking fluid. I like to splatter it and, and mark fine lines to create patterns that suggest branches and weeds and sticks. And I like to, to splatter a liquid masking fluid to with a toothbrush to give the impression that there's all kinds of leaves and activity even though I'm not rendering each individual one. I'm going to begin by using a uh, bottle filled with liquid masking fluid and it has a, a fine point on it. It has a steel tip. This is typically used for quilling, uh, for glue. However, I fill it with masking fluid and I find it much more economical than the pre-packaged ones which you buy. And uh, they're not maintenance free. They do clog from time to time just as the, the pre-configured ones you buy. But I find it's an economical solution. So I use this to start to create the patterns created by sticks and briar bushes and then I start to indicate where some of the distant tree trunks are by putting a bead of this there. And when you're using this you don't have to squeeze the bottle hard. If you do you'll you'll get a very inconsistent uh, stream of masking fluid. You just have a, put a light pressure on it just enough to keep uh, the fluid flowing to the tip and you almost write with it like a pen but you don't have to squeeze it out like you would if you were trying to glue something um, and sometimes when it, you do get an inconsistent bead you can just use the tip to kind of smooth it out a little bit so 
So here I'm just uh, creating patterns of, of linear marks that suggest briar bushes and uh, limbs off trees and tall grass and just the typical things you find around wooded areas and the side of creeks and rivers. And as I do this I try to create overlap so I'll bring uh, a bead of masking fluid to the edge of a shape and I'll lift it the tip and then I'll pick it back up on the other side of that shape so it gives the impression that the linear mark is going behind the particular object. Here I'm continuing to make these linear marks and give a suggestion of the patterns of branches and grasses and it does get to be a little tedious at times and takes a little bit of patience. Here I have a bottle that has a wider opening and doesn't have a steel tip and it gives a, a wider bead and I've, what I've done is I've filled these tree shapes, these trunks, using this wider bead. I'm going to use the fine line of bead of masking fluid to indicate a shoreline here a little bit and just uh, mask some of these little rock shapes in the distance. I don't want to try and paint around them. It's easier just to mask them initially and then come back and remove that and save the white that way. Next I'm going to take the bottle that has the wider bead and uh, I'm going to make some some marks here around this branch that represent the groupings, large groups of uh, leaves that are on this branch. And um, these are uh, shapes that I want to be a bright green. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask these leaf shapes just kind of randomly using this bottle. And then it'll dry and I'll paint with some darker values over top of this. And then later I'll remove the masking uh, fluid which will, re will reveal these white shapes that I can then come over and glaze with a with a nice bright green yellow uh, tone. This is what I mean when I'm talking about patterns these marks, this, these groupings of the marks that I'm making create a pattern that gives a suggestion of these larger leaf shapes that are uh, closer to you than all the, the distant ones. Now I want to create a finer texture, uh, finer patterns of, of uh, splatter marks. So I'm going to put some paper towel over the area I want to protect. I don't want all the splatter to go into the area of the water. So I'm putting some masking fluid, the liquid masking fluid, into the toothbrush and I'll uh, splatter it by pulling back on the bristles and letting them go and I'll also splatter it by tapping it on my hand. Tapping it on my hand gives larger marks, um, larger spray than the, uh, the, the technique to pull them back, the, the bristles back and splatter with your finger. So I use a combination of those and I'm after a, a, just a fine texture in the background that will kind of give that suggestion of the light sparkling through all those hundreds of thousands of leaves that are in the distance. Here I've moved to the left side and I'm splattering some more of the masking fluid in this area here to suggest bushes on the ground and leaves up in the tree and I, I'm using both techniques where I pull back the, the bristles and splatter it and hit it against my hand. I've let the masking fluid air dry. I don't like to use a hair dryer because I feel it affects the, the way it bonds to the paper and releases. Um, so I've let it air dry completely and now I'm going to come in and start painting. And to start I'm using some cerulean blue and I'm just painting the areas that would be uh, where the sky comes down and uh, 
to the point where it hits the, the tops of the trees. And it's going to go beyond some of those tree tops because there's going to be patterns of the blue tone coming through the trees, uh, as, through the leaves and the branches. So I kind of randomly, randomly bring this down and just apply this middle value cerulean blue wash to suggest the sky. Now, I'm going to paint the shapes that represent the distant tree lines and the bushes and, and some of the shoreline. And I'm doing this with a big wash brush. This is a jumbo round small silver black velvet brush that I'm using. And I'm using a mixture of raw umber with a little bit of um, raw sienna and some royal blue and just different combinations of those colors and also sap green and pyrrole red. So there's a variety of colors I'm, I'm using here in various mixtures. This dark green that I'm applying is rather cool tone. It's sap green, pyrrole red, and the royal blue makes it a little darker and a little cooler. So that's what that dark green tone is, blue green. And towards the top it's more raw sienna and raw umber. And you can see how that wash starts to puddle a little bit where the masking fluid is. You do have to be aware of that and come back from time to time and pick up some of that excess water. So I'm painting around the large tree shape. I'm just bringing uh, this tone across the page in between shapes. And on the left I have the tree trunks where I've masked so I can be pretty carefree as I, I apply the paint beside those areas. As I apply the wash, I try to keep a, both a warm and a cool element as I move throughout the composition. So some of the green tones I'm putting down are fairly cool, uh, while others will have a touch of warmth to them, such as what I just applied. So my warmer mixtures tend to be sap green with pyrrole red, and they might have a little bit of royal blue to darken them if I want it to be a dark value, but the sap green and pyrrole red give me a pretty uh, good green and I can take that to the warm side by adding the red. And then again my cooler mixture tends to be the uh, sap green with a little touch of pyrrole red in it but uh, a larger amount of royal blue. So that's that cool mixture that I'm applying there it has more royal blue in it. And um, But those three colors I can get a lot out of. Uh, the sap green, pyrrole red, and royal blue. And then uh, this mixture I've added a little uh, rose matter to even give it a, a redder tone and that, that combination I have there is almost giving me a neutral gray. I've, I've mixed some reds and some greens and um, it's giving me a bit of a neutral tone on the right side. And this mixture here is a little bit more sap green and then I'll bring in some that has a little bit more red in it. Now towards the base of this tree, I'm going to bring in some earthy tones. This is similar to what was the top of the trees. There's some raw umber, some raw sienna, and I've mixed in a little bit of royal blue into the mixture to cool it down. And uh, here I've added some burnt sienna, so it provides some warmth. And I just let these colors mingle on the page. I'm not really trying to render all the root systems on the, on the ground here and all the little pebbles and everything. I'm just painting this as a large shape, but I'm trying to vary the color. And it's a pretty consistent value, but I have some warm and some cool uh, variation going on, even though the value is fairly consistent middle value. I've applied the, the paint, the wash, and now I'm going to take a fine mist spray here and just soften that up a little bit and let the colors diffuse and run around. So when I first applied the wash, I was working wet on dry, but as I worked with it and added the wash and now the spray, anything I do would be wet and wet. And you can see now that it's completely dry and how much lighter it dried. 
Here I'm coming back with a, a very dark mixture. This mixture still uses royal blue. I have some uh, rose matter quinacridone in it and some um, sap green. But it's a it's a blue tends to be a, a blue green and at times purple tone that I'm putting in there, but it's very dark value. And here I'm gonna soften that and just diffuse that color around there. And, and keep in mind that there's a lot of masking fluid which has been applied in these areas. So even though I'm putting this very dark value down, once I lift the, the masking fluid in some of these areas, there's gonna be a lot more light than what there is right now, but it'll be contrast by these dark values that I'm applying at, at this point in the painting process. And here as I apply this paint, I'm uh, once again I'm going to uh, come back and I'm going to soften that up a little bit and let some of that paint run by using a fine mist spray bottle. I had applied uh, a middle value wash before but it really once it had dried thoroughly it, it lightened up quite a bit. It really um, lost some of its value so now I'm coming up back in with some more powerful value and uh, putting it around in a lot of these areas in a very fairly large shape. And here's where I'm going to take the fine mist spray and just diffuse that color and let it run down. I'm going to bring in uh, some more uh, color here and let this dark value go all the way to the bottom of the page. So in this mixture here, in this area, I have a combination of some blue-green tones that even, uh, even though they're blue-green, some are leaning a little bit towards neutral. And I have some burnt sienna and uh, raw sienna tones mixed in with a little raw umber also. And I'm taking some of these earthy tones and I'm painting that distant shore on the other uh, side there of this, from this water. And again, there's uh, there's some of those areas that have quite a bit of masking fluid, so once the, the masking fluid is dry, the paint is dry, and the masking fluid is removed, there's going to be a lot more uh, light shapes in that area. Now I'm going to take a mixture of cerulean blue and raw sienna. The warmer tone has more raw sienna in it, and the cooler tone has more cerulean blue in it. And I'm taking a one inch flat brush, it's a middle value, and I'm just putting a large wash on this tree and that's a cooler version there that has more cerulean blue in it on the left side, of the, the shadowed side of that tree. This large trunk just kind of stands out here in the composition. Now I'm going to add a little royal blue to the mixture to darken it up even more and, and make a slightly darker, darker value. Now I'm going to begin to paint the water and I'm going to start with a wash of cerulean blue. The cerulean blue has a little bit of uh, raw sienna in it. Um, so there's, you can see a few areas where it's a bit of a neutral tone and other areas where it's a little bluer. So well, I'm using a one inch brush still and the direction of my brush strokes help describe the, the contour and the, the flatness of the water so I'm trying to put apply the paint now with with the uh, purpose and the direction that I'm making my brush strokes I don't want them to be vertical at this point because it's a horizontal surface I want to contour that surface and the water is very flat and you can see how moist the mixture I am is I'm putting down there are times when you might want to use a dry brush effect on the water like this, but that's not my intent. And um, I'm trying to give full coverage as I apply this. Next, I'm going to show some of the bright green tone being picked up in the water. So I'm using some quinacridone gold a little bit of sap green in it gives kind of a green gold tone 
and again my brush strokes are moving in in the direction uh, of of the, the contour of the the water so they're they're moving horizontally so that I can help describe the contour of the water and here I've got uh, quinacridone gold is that bright gold tone that rich gold color I'm going to take my fine mist spray and I'm going to soften some edges and let some paint run together and I've made the horizontal brush strokes and when I use a spray bottle I start to get a vertical element uh, because of the gravity I'm working at a, a 20 degree angle gravity starts to pull that wash down from the spray and what I like about that is my brush strokes have been horizontal but that vertical element is more of a reflection of what's going on on land with the tree trunks and the foliage which is a vertical element but it's just picking it up in the reflection now I'm gonna paint one of these rock shapes a very dark value I'll be using mixtures of raw umber burnt sienna some uh, quinacridone and gold mixed in and uh, some royal blue but I'll be using warm and cool mixtures in combinations even even though some of these areas are very dark value I'll still vary the warm and the cool that I'm using um, but you can see uh, it's a very rich tone if you look at the area I'm painting now it's quinacridone and gold with some of these other dark value mixtures blending in um, and uh, the area I just painted there has a little bit more royal blue so it's a cooler mm -hmm. element I'm going to give you an indication of these rock shapes using uh, dark value combinations of, of these paints that I just uh, mentioned. So some of them will have a little bit more water in the mixture also, so it'll lighten up a little bit. You can see I'm using the same treatment on several of these rocks and using the same colors also. So some are larger than others, some are longer, some are just little spots, just little touches of value here and there uh, in the distance to give you indication of some smaller rocks. And keep in mind early on I decided to eliminate some of the, the rocks that are in places that I didn't care for or uh, I'm not trying to paint every rock that was showing in, in the photograph. I'm coming back to this area where I've already done a considerable amount of work. However, I still don't have the value I want and I need to do some uh, smaller brush work. There is a uh, uh, a mental approach called plan do check act and uh, you, you plan a certain outcome you check to see if you got that result and based on your findings you act accordingly so in in this instance I, I, I want a dark value shape here and it's dried lighter than what I want so I've come back a few times here to to go after the value that I want and also as I do this I'm incorporating some smaller brushwork and uh, and some of some of this area has just some some linear marks that represent t tree trunks that are very dark valued, and I'll be putting those in uh, with this tone right within uh, some of these dark shapes. So here I'm going to make some of the, the linear marks to give the suggestion of tree trunks amongst. Uh, this very dark valued area and as I do this some of these shapes are going to be overlapped by the area that I've masked in the end so once I take that mask off there'll be a light shape in front of it and some of those I'll be uh, putting a, a bright green glaze over and they will appear to be uh, overlapping these linear marks that I'm making now with a dark value and also because I have so much 
texture that I'm creating in here, some of these marks that I'm making will will be broken up because of the, the areas where I preserve some of the white of the paper. Here I'm moving more to the foreground and uh, I'm taking that, that dark value and giving a suggestion of some branches amongst these tree trunks here. And I'm also going to uh, make some marks here towards the base of the tree to suggest that they're branches from a bush or something that's growing there in the ground at the base of the tree. And uh, as I make some of these marks, I'm thinking about the direction that they're going and some of them will have an arc, some of them will be straight, some will overlap, some will curve uh, and it give the appearance that they're curving back and pointing towards something. So I think about that as I make these marks. They're not, even though they appear haphazard, there's a there's a an intent when I put each one of these down. And all of this overlap and, and the shapes going behind other shapes helps build depth in the composition. Now I'm going to take some clear water using the one inch brush and I'm going to make some horizontal marks, some little puddles of moisture on the area I've already painted. And now I'm going to take some of these darker values that have sap green and pyro red and royal blue in them and some raw umber and I'm going to let that uh, color diff diffuse in these areas that I applied the clear water. So these are picking up the the, uh, the tones and the values that are in these trees and they also suggest the verticality of what's on land versus the, the horizontal brush strokes that I've made with the clear water and then the, the brush marks that I made earlier when I was painting the water. Here I'm adding a little bit more of this dark value. These brush marks that I'm making now, I want to be dark value. I want to be linear. I want them to be narrow because I want them to suggest the reflection of the tree trunks uh, in the water. I don't really like that light tone that I have in the bottom right corner. So I'm going to take my one inch brush. I'm going to load it up with a kind of a green gold tone. And I'm going to uh, paint this as a larger shape that's more of a, an earthy green middle value. So I've thoroughly dried my paper and I'm going to take my rubber cement pickup eraser and I'm going to rub it across the surface to pick up all the areas where I had splattered and made marks with uh, the liquid masking fluid. And as I do this, I try not to drag my pickup eraser into the tape from the inside going out. I try to come over the top of it or along the edge so I don't pull up my tape. But you can see that comes up uh, fairly quickly once you start going. The, the eraser itself is about two and a half by two and a half uh, square and it covers quite a bit of area with just one pass but you do have to go back over the areas a few times and rub it so you get everything up and I go over it with my hand so that I can feel where there's any uh, residual um, masking fluid. Now I've removed all the masking fluid, I'm going to come back in I'm going to splatter once again on top of these tree trunk shapes. And you may ask why would I do that after I've already had it on and taken it off. It's because you, you have to think in your layers and in your planning realistically what would happen. 
So I have all this activity with branches and leaves, and uh, I've, I've applied that texture using the splatter of the mask, and I've also covered these trees. So now that it's uncovered, if I paint the trees, it's going to have nothing overlapping it. So what I'll do is I'll splatter it, dry it, and then I'll come back and I'll paint the trees. So now when I come in here and I paint these trees as I am with a, a dark middle value, there's areas where I have just splattered that are going to remain light once I remove that dried masking fluid, once everything's dried. If I had not gone back and splattered on top of this again, you would, you would get exactly what you're seeing right now. It would just be a solid tone with no overlap. And realistically, with all these branches and leaves everywhere, that, that wouldn't happen. You're going to have some leaves in front of these tree trunks. And so once I dry it and I remove the mask again, I'll have some light splatter marks on these trees that I can glaze over. And it'll look like there's leaves on top of these trees. I couldn't have gotten that effect if I didn't take the time to to splatter some masking fluid on them once again before I started to paint them. Another approach is I didn't have to necessarily mask these trunks and I could have just splattered it and then painted the trunks and I would have had the same effect. I want a darker shadowed area on these trees so I'm taking a half inch flat brush with a dark value mixture with some some royal blue, some raw umber and I'm just making some vertical marks on the back edge of those to give the suggestion of shadows and then I'm going to paint some some tree trunks back in some of these areas where I had so much heavy masking uh, I want to pick some of those shapes up a little bit next I'm going to take my pickup eraser again and rub off that extra masking that I put down and now you can see because I went back and did that, I have light shapes and textures that overlap the trees that I painted. Had I not done that, they would have just been a solid tone and it wouldn't have matched what else the, the other activity that's going on in the composition. Now I'm going to take a bright green mixture of sap green and cadmium yellow light. I'm going to paint some of these areas that were masked. So now I get this feeling of these bright leaf shapes in front of the trees and on the branches. There are times when I use this technique in a winter scene and a lot of it um, remains uh, the white of the paper because it's given the suggestion of snow. However, this is a spring scene and I preserve that pure white paper so I could come back and put a nice bright glaze on these shapes that I masked uh, at the start of my process. So I'm doing this with a wash brush. This is back to the Jumbo Round Small Silver Black Velvet brush that I have. It's a squirrel synthetic blend. And I'm just putting touches of this color on these areas that were masked. So this still represents some of these leafy shapes from this, this tree in the foreground. I'll put some washes on some of those textures that I preserved in the background, but I'm going to make these a little cooler uh, of, a, of a blue, leaning more towards a blue or a blue green uh, than the, more so than the, the yellow green. So you can see, you can start to differentiate um, the distance in these, these shapes because of the, the color. One's cool and a little darker, one's brighter and also the size of the texture and the patterns. These, these shapes in the closer to the foreground are larger than the, the very fine splatter textures that are in the background. And as I move around putting the various glaze, uh, glazes on some of these areas, I'll change it up a little bit and I'll go kind of to the blue, the cooler blue-green tone and I'll go back to the bright yellow because there's a lot of there's sunlight hit in some of these areas, there's shadows in some of these areas so I try to mix it up both with warm and cool. 
there's so many different greens available to the artist to use uh, but i really don't use that many i kind of use sap green as one of my base colors it's a convenience color but it's it's a tone that i like to work with and i can shift the hue on it by adding blue or adding yellow to it so i can take my sap green i can make it more of a yellow green just by adding uh, a, a yellow tone such as cadmium yellow and if I wanted to uh, move more towards uh, the blue side, I can add um, royal blue, I can add ultramarine or cobalt. So I can shift the hue by using that one base green, or I can mix them totally from scratch just using yellow and blue. A lot of that's up to personal preference, but I don't feel the need to have 10 different tube colored greens in my palette because I can get a lot of mileage just by using my sap green. Now I'm going to take some of my darkest value and this has some raw umber and royal blue and even a little rose matter in it and I'm using a quill brush here that has a fine point and I'm just putting some dark touches of value in some areas to strengthen up edge to help further define uh, foreground, middle ground, background. This is something I do in a lot of my paintings, no matter what the subject. Towards the end, I start to come in and make these dark valued shapes and I do it where shapes intersect. I, I do it where I feel an edge needs strengthen. Or I, I, I put them in places to help further define the, the spatial relationships between the, the foreground, the middle ground, the background. And uh, some of these just these last minute marks really help um, bring some, some more depth and strength to the overall painting. Here I'm going to make some of these dark value marks on some of the rock shapes. However, uh, the marks that I'm making here aren't going to be as uh, strong a statement. They're not going to be as large. They're not going to be as many as what I've done in the foreground here on that the large tree. So there's a little bit of a shadow here on this rock and a little reflection. But I'm just going to put some touches here and there on some of these rocks. Again, not enough to, to really take away from what's going on in the, more in the foreground, but overall it, it helps provide a little bit of balance and I think helps strengthen the overall composition. Next here, I want a darker linear element and particularly in, in closer to the foreground here. So there's a branch that's kind of gotten lost. So I'm taking a, a rigger brush with a dark value of raw umber, royal blue. And um, I'm just giving an indication of, of the branch and the branch shapes. And uh, some of these branches that are coming off and coming in from the, out, from the frame of reference here in the composition from that you can't really see their origin, but they're they're coming in from the side and coming down. And here I'm giving a suggestion of moving behind the tree trunk. Here I'm taking the same mixture with my rigger brush and just making some fine linear marks here. Some of them are arcing like uh, you would get if it were grass hanging over the shore there and some more up in the tree I want to have a stronger larger dark value on the back side of this tree so I'm coming in once again and making a, a, a stronger dark value uh, shape here to, to make it look like it's more in shadow I'm going to put a white mat on this to get a better look at it. And there's my painting, Spring Green. I hope you enjoyed this. If you want to get the reference material for this video, 
you can go to the landing page for my online learning center and at the top you'll find a link labeled YouTube reference material. If you need information about the materials I use, you can go to the studio page of my website, rsorwitzart.com. And if you have questions, you can always email me at contactrsorwitzart at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.